Uh, you can turn to Luke 15 in your Bibles. I'm going to read right away this very famous parable. It's probably the most famous parable that Jesus taught. It is the longest parable of Jesus, um, and it is probably the most well-known to, to all of us. Maybe this along with the parable of the sower and the soils are two of the most well-known parables. It's often called the parable of the prodigal son. It starts in verse 11 of Luke 15. Then he said, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in the land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare? Um, and I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned and am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he rose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion on him, and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. And bring the fatted calf here and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry." Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was angry and would not go in. Therefore his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you, I never transgressed your commandment at any time, and yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again, and was lost and is found. So this most familiar parable and the longest one that Jesus wrote um, We often read it, and the story, we know the whole story, we read the whole story, but we often stop at verse 24. We often stop with the application of this parable with the lost son being found. We don't really read about the older brother very much, kind of like that's that's why this parable has got the title, the prodigal son. But when you look at it, if as much, if not more word count is found regarding the older brother than the prodigal son. There's actually very little about the prodigal son in it. It's mostly about the father and the older brother. Um, When we were studying Genesis chapter 33 a few weeks ago, Jacob and Esau's reunion, verse 4 in Genesis 33 caught my attention. I was reading it, and this is what I read. But Esau ran ran to meet him, embraced him, fell on his neck, and kissed him, and they wept. And immediately my mind said, that's very familiar. And my mind went to Luke 15, because that's what verse uh, 20 speaks of. It says, and he rose and he came to his father, but he was still a grave. His father saw him, had a compassion, ran, fell on his neck, and kissed him. And so I was curious if this is just a normal thing, or is there something connecting Luke 15 with the story of Jacob and Esau? It was just a hunch at this point, if there was anything to the connection here. 
Um, so the first thing I did is I looked at the Septuagint of Genesis 33:4, which is the Greek translation of it, which was what Jesus probably used and the disciples used as a translation of the Old Testament scriptures, and then Luke 15, 20. And I found it very fascinating that the wording is quite similar in some places, identical in these two. So, for example, the text reads, and he, I'm going to try to just translate this for you quickly, and he ran, Esau, ran, and um, unto, uh, to meet, to meet him, that's his brother Jacob, right? Esau ran to meet him and embraced him, embraced him, and here's where it gets most similar. Um, or sorry, ran to meet him and embraced him. Ephelacin uh, uh, Ephil- is a little bit, um, it's actually kind of difficult here because it's embraced him. It's kind of repeated. He read two words. He grabbed him and grabbed him in two different words. Um, and, but this pros epesen, this other word here, um, sorry, I got that backwards. My bad, I said that wrong. This is, he embraced him here. This is the word, it's out of order. He kissed him. So that comes first. And, and here is the idea, and he embraced or he fell on him. But this is interesting. Upon the neck of him. And they wept together. And wept together. So that's the, that's the Genesis 33, 4. And I know you can't read any of my writing at all whatsoever. But you have the idea that, that he, he ran, he kissed, fell upon the neck, and wept. Well, when you translate Luke 15, 20, you get the first part of that, which I'm not going to do for time's sake. But this is the same words. These, I have them highlighted already. You can see them in Greek. I know they don't look exactly alike. That's because they're different forms, but it's the same word. And it has the father, he ran, fell, and this is the exact same phrase, fell on, upon the neck of him and kissed him. Now, this is where, as I was working through this, when I, my hunch became more than a hunch. Because this is the only two places in Scripture where you have someone running, uh, falling on the neck of, and kissing another person. The only two places in all of Scripture where you have that in that order. Not the only time someone kissed someone or ran to them, but like that. Running, kissing, falling on the neck. And those words are used in the Greek there. That's so unusual that it is significant. And so my suspicions began to be confirmed that Jesus is using the story of Jacob and Esau as the basis for his parable of the prodigal son. Now, began to think, is there anybody else who sees this? Because that's always a danger when you're doing Bible study and you're the only one who finds it. Well, there's a lot of people who have alluded to this. Some of the commentaries allude to the possibilities here. But then I picked up a book by Peter Williams, and I recommend it. It's The Surprising Genius of Jesus. And what it is, is he's showing how the the human uh, nature of Jesus was a genius in, as a master storyteller and just, just should be in the likes of Albert Einstein, Aristotle, I'm talking about the human nature, not the divine nature, that's obvious, but the human nature was a genius. And most of this book, is not the only thing in this book, most of this short book is him actually showing this, showing how Jesus uses the story of Jacob and Esau as the foundation for the story of the prodigal son. So good news for me, my suspicions were not only confirmed by the text, but other scholars actually have written about this as well. So I utilized that this book a lot and was like, okay, I want to read more about this. So I began to wonder, what are some other connections? 
Well, you have the story starts with two sons. Well, two sons is a very common thing throughout Genesis, right? Isaac and Ishmael, um, Jacob and Esau. But you have two sons where an elder stays home and a younger goes away. Does that sound familiar in the parable of the prodigal son? And there's animosity between the older son and the younger son because the older son feels like the younger son has cheated him out of an inheritance. Um, In Jacob and Esau's story, that's true. He did cheat him out of an inheritance. In the parable of the prodigal son, the older son just feels like he cheated him out of an inheritance. He didn't really. And then, in the story, the father welcomes or loves the younger son in a seemingly favorite way. And that's what the older son in the parable at least accuses him of, right? You're showing favorites because you never gave me all these things, but you gave him this stuff. And we know in the story of Jacob and Esau, that's actually the impetus for Esau's animosity is the favoritism of Isaac toward Jacob. And then you have the text I already showed you, the reconciliation texts. Brothers in, in, in Jacob and Esau reconciling father with the younger son in Luke. But you have a reconciliation text. All these things together made it very clear that yes, Jesus is a genius teacher, but what he's doing is he is using the story of Jacob and Esau as the foundation and the framework in which he tells this, com- this different story of the prodigal son as we call it. It's probably best called the parable of the lost sons. Well, in working through um, Peter Williams, some of the things he wrote, he added several other things that I did not see, but he did, and he's a Hebrew and Greek um, linguist. He added this, you have the younger brother herding animals in a far country. Uh, Jacob with Laban and the younger son with the pigs. You have someone saying he's dying of hunger. The son is, I'm going to perish from hunger. Esau in the story, broader story, I'm going to die from hunger, right? You have the younger son wearing, uh, being the favorite, even wearing good robes. Um, the best, younger son wearing the best robes by the father in the prodigal, parable of the prodigal. And you have Jacob putting on Esau's robes to deceive him. So you have the robes connection, the clothing connection. The use of the word draw near is found in, in, in verse 15, 1, the, the, which is a common connection. And you see Esau drawing near and Jacob drawing near. Um, the older brother being angry, it's in both of those accounts, concerns about losing the inheritance. And then this is, I didn't know this at all, the young goat as a meal. So in the Jacob and Esau story, it's the goats, the goat that uh, Rebecca makes, right? It's a, it's a meal of goat, young goat. It's the fatted calf, right, that the father kills. But when the young, older son is upset, he says, I want a meal of young goat. And I didn't know this. Williams pointed this out. It's the only two places in the scripture where there's a meal of young goat. So it's obviously there's some connections there. Now, there are some contrasts as well. Jacob goes out poor and returns wealthy. The younger son goes out wealthy and returns poor. As I said, Jacob cooks the young goat to deceive the father. Well, the brother is upset that he never got a young goat cooked for him. Esau claims to be dying of hunger, but the younger son is dying of hunger. So there's some contrast as well. Isaac calls Jacob to come close because he cannot see him when they're, he's being deceived. The father sees the younger son a great way off. Biblical Hebrew authors, like Jesus is, teachers, rabbis, often use parallelism and then they'll have reversals and irony. Most of the parables use irony. Most of the parables have a surprising twist in them somewhere, something that shouldn't be that way. And most of the parables 
leave the story untold at the end. It's actually a really smart, uh, a genius way to teach. It's kind of like playing a common tune and then not playing the last note. And everyone remembers that last note more than they would if you'd played it. Because <laughs> they, like, they're, they're playing it in their head. That happens in this one, by the way. The story ends with the father, your son's, we don't have a re resolution. And that's intentional. So, I think the evidence is overwhelming that Jesus is using the story of Jacob and Esau as the foundation of his parable about the two sons. Why does that matter? Because to have a proper interpretation and a thorough understanding of the meaning of the parable, we need to know what material Jesus was using and why he was using it. I contend that we won't come at the primary correct interpretation of the parable without understanding, or we, we might accidentally come upon it, we won't uh, normally come upon the right interpretation without understanding the framework for it, the foundation of it, what is going on here. And that's why I think this parable, like many of the others that are interpreted by people, have a, such a wide variety of interpretive ideas to them. People come with all sorts of ideas. I don't think it's because they've really focused in on what was Jesus getting at? Why was he using the story of Jacob and Esau? Why that story? Why this particular time? Who's he talking to and why would he use this story to talk to them about it? Unless we settle those questions, we're going to be deficient in our interpretation. We're going to lack some things in understanding it. So I think it does matter. Why does Jesus employ an Old Testament history, though? Why does he even tell a parable using an Old Testament story? Well, the point of Peter Williams' book is actually that he's a genius. <laughs> so the book doesn't just do this one. It goes to all sorts of... That's the main one, but it spends a great deal of time in his book uh, showing other places where Jesus does this very thing. The point is that. So maybe that's one of the reasons why he does because it's just effective stories are often rooted in historical realities. They resonate with us. But the ultimate reason, I think, is not just Jesus because he's a genius, but this. Jesus is drawing his audience into a moral tale and using... Um, the story of Jacob and Esau, which his audience would know very well, delivers a powerful punch at the audience at the end of the story. There's a powerful punch that he delivers to them. Who would understand the story of Jacob and Esau best? Well, Israelites would, right? By the way, the story of Jacob and Esau is one of the most commonly told Jewish stories um, by Jewish people today. The whole thing, from the deception to the reconciliation, it's, the rabbis have write, write all sorts of things about it. But you know, above all the Jewish people who would understand it most would probably be the people whose job was to copy down these stories over and over and over again. And that is precisely who Jesus is addressing in this story. So look at chapter, Luke 15, 1. And you'll notice something very interesting here. It says, Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes complained. So we've got two groups of two sorts of people, right? On one hand, you have the... Uh, Publicans or tax collectors and the sinners. Sinners generally meant outrageous or evident sinners. Sometimes people think those are referring to prostitutes and so on. Probably not just prostitutes, probably prostitutes and the Johns and the pimps and all that, you know, the whole world there. And then you have this on this side, and then you have, and they're drawing near to Jesus. They're coming toward him. And then you have 
the uh, Pharisees and the scribes who are complaining about those coming toward him. Because they say, this man receives sinners and eats with them. So he spoke this parable to them. So we have in the text exactly why he's telling this parable and who he's telling it to. The occasion for the telling of these, this parable is the complaint of the scribes and Pharisees against the sinners and the publicans drawing near to Jesus. That's the, that's the reason he tells the parable. That's why it's here. Does that already start to like f- put some like flags off in your head? We've got two sons in the parable, and we have two groups of two people. You've got one who's complaining about the other coming near to Jesus, just like you had an older son complaining about a younger son who was coming near his father. So the target is unmistakable. But one might look at this and say, but that's not what he says right before the parable of the sons. That's what he says before a parable about sheep and a parable about coins. And then he talks about the parable of the son. Yes, these are all related parables. He's telling three parables about the same thing. So the first parable, which we didn't read, is a familiar one. It's about the shepherd who has a hundred sheep. One of them is lost, and he leaves the 99 in the fold to go look for the one who is lost. And when he finds the lost sheep, he calls his neighbors and friends to him, and he says, Rejoice with me, for I found my lost sheep. Second parable. There's a woman and she has ten coins. One of those coins is lost. Whatever that was, we don't know fully know. Some think it was some wedding dowry. There could be all sorts of speculation, but the point is she's got silver. So we've got sheep, and then we've got silver. One of them is lost, so she spends all day diligently looking all through her house to find the one lost coin. And when she finds the lost coin, she calls her friends and neighbors, just like the shepherd, says, rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I lost. Jesus adds a little addendum there like he did in the shepherd in saying, in heaven's also having a party too. And then we have a man had two sons. So the lost sheep, 1%, was lost, right? One out of a hundred. The lost coin, 10% was lost. One out of 10. The parable of the sons, how many are lost? A hundred percent are lost. You see, the prodigal son is lost, but the reason we have the end of the story with the older son, he appears to be lost too. Because He doesn't care at all about his father. Even when he wants a party, he doesn't say, why don't you party with me? He says, why don't you throw a party for me to have with my friends? He doesn't want the father. He's away from them. He's not drawing near the father. You have 100% that are lost. And this is what's interesting. You have the lost sheep who's lost away. You have the lost coin that's lost at home. And then you've got two sons, one lost away and one lost at home. And so Jesus is, you can clearly see how this is a unit, right? And you can see his genius of how he's building here. Because the tendency of humans is, they're lost. No, they're lost. And he says, you're both lost. That's what he's building there. So what happens? The shepherd diligently looks, right? Right? The woman carefully looks, and the father diligently watches. And when the sheep is found, there is rejoicing. When the lost coin is found, there is rejoicing in an angelic party. And when the son is found, there is rejoicing, and he describes an extravagant party using these very colorful phrases and words. Everyone must come and rejoice. Um, kill the fatted calf, 
put the best robe on him, put a ring on him. Like, and then the, the older son, he hears music and dancing. So it's this extravagant party. And so all three parables, they work together. And so that's why we should not call this the parable of the prodigal son. We should call it the parable of the lost sons. And this is all three parables of lost things. We've got sheep, silver, and sons, which I think is a very, another part of Jesus' master teaching is a very beautiful description because uh, you have all, you, you have the idea of we are known as sheep, we are valuable as silver, we are sons. And there's that the idea of it's, it's, there's a value there. And in fact, when you get to the last one, who does the father value? He values both, right? He values the prodigal and, and, and throws him a party. And then when the older son complains, he says, son, you are always with me. All that I have is yours. He doesn't say, you're nothing to me. He's everything. It's like, I want you both. What do we learn from the parable then? Well, first of all, we learned that there is a seeker, a watcher, and the lost sons and the lost sheep and the lost coins are not the seeker, <laughs> right? God seeks after the sinners. The purpose of the seeker is to bring the lost to its proper place, the flock, the bank, the home. But the lost is mostly passive. We do have the prodigals coming to himself and coming to the father, but there's some notes about that that I think we sometimes miss. Yes, the son does come with humility, but did you notice he still comes with his own ideas and plan? Here's what I'll do. I'll go back to my father's house because the servants have a lot. And here's what I'll say. Make me a servant rather than a son and I'll work for it. He's still coming on his own terms, right? And so, yes, there is humility, and in a sense, there is confession, which is lauded and should be lauded here. But you notice how in the text, the way Jesus tells the story, and this is the masterful telling, do you notice what the son is able to say and what he's not able to say according to his plan? In verse 20, he arose, came to his father, but when he was still a great way off, his father saw him, had compassion on him, ran and fell on his neck and kissed him, and the son said to him, so here's the speech he's rehearsed, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him. He didn't get to his plan, right? The father interrupts him before he even gets to, make me one of your servants. Why? Because the father's embrace of the son is not based upon the son's plan, but the father's love. That's why. It doesn't matter what he says next. It doesn't matter that he's got a plan to work his way back into his father's good graces. So I do think it's difficult, and we probably shouldn't look at the prodigal son as, an, as a line-by-line uh, -line example of how we should respond to, um, to our sin. Yes, we ought to respond with humility and confession, but I don't think we ought to look at this as, well, this is what we should do. We come and say you'll be a servant, and then God will say, oh, well, that's, that's good of you. We'll see how you do as a servant before you graduate into sonship, because <laughs> that's not the way at all that God operates. So we have this, so, so even in the seeking, even in the movement of the son, it's still incomplete. It's still not, it's not, it's not, it's not great, Right? There's things missing in it. There's under, misunderstanding in it. It's, not, it's good, but not good enough. Furthermore, I think the prodigal does not seem to fully regret how he had sinned against his father love, but was driven to something outside of his control. Well, I'm not criticizing him. I think he's very normal. He's like you and me. Whenever you read about the story of the prodigal son, what we always point out is that he wasted his inheritance, right? And so we look at the prodigal son and we say, what a fool. But we miss a very important verse. Verse 14. 
But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in the land, and he began to be in want. He's, yes, he wastes his living, but what puts him over the edge is something outside of his control. What puts him in the pigsty is not his wasting, but he might say his dumb luck, right? There's a famine. Now, this too is a fantastic connection to Old Testament because the number one way in the Old Testament in which God routinely disciplined His people was by sending famine. Constantly He did that. Don't you think Jesus knew that? And don't you think the scribes and Pharisees who'd written every word of Scripture down knew that famine meant God's discipline, God's judgment? So important is famine as a part of God's judgment or discipline that you have it as a repeated emphasis in the book of Revelation in what the end, the end uh, tribulation, the great tribulation will be made up of. So you have his riotous living or his wasteful living coupled with God's scourge of famine which sets him over the edge. This is speculation, but I wonder if he would have run back home without the famine. He's probably a bit of a smart young man. He probably could have found another way to make ends meet in this foreign country, but God would not let him. And so God sends a famine. Thank God for providential, timely famines. <laughs> right? So Jesus is not explicitly portraying in this story salvation by grace alone. It's not the point of the story. He is stabbing at the scribes and Pharisees and really anyone who would think that grace comes through personal ingenuity and hard work by making himself one of his servants. That's not the main point of the parable, but he is stabbing at that idea in the parable. And so that's a valid takeaway. The son's repentance is a valid, or his, his humility is a valid takeaway. The father's embrace of him is a valid takeaway. But if that were the point of the story, would he not have ended in verse 24? Because that is exactly how he ended in the parable of the lost sheep. And now we ended in the parable of the lost coin. He ended both of those the same place. There was great rejoicing. There was great rejoicing. Verse 24, and they began to be merry. That's where it should end. If the point, the primary point, is the return of the prodigal and the love of the father. But the fact that we actually only are halfway through the story now tells us that's not the primary point. There's more to it than that. Now, I hope you understand what I'm saying. I'm saying that those are valid secondary points in the parable that can be applied. This parable can absolutely be a comfort to those whose children have wandered away from Christ. <laughs> this parable can absolutely be a comfort to us when we consider ourselves as the prodigal who have come to Christ only because of His grace and He has fell on our neck and kissed us. The, absolutely, that can be a valid way of applying a parable. We have to always keep in mind there is one particular correct interpretation with a variety of applications that can flow from that. So I don't want to, um, in one in a sense, denigrate a beloved parable's applications that have held all of us at different times in, in, with, with hope, because it's true. But the bigger point is the party. That's the bigger point. More is said about the party than about the father's receipt of the son. And it's descriptive, isn't it? We could just say they had a big party, they rejoiced. But instead, the text says, he gives a great description. The father said to his servants, bring out the best robe, 
Put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf here. Kill it. Let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. The older son heard, drew near. And he heard music and dancing. So there's a lot of emphasis on the party, right? That's a lot more emphatic than in the parable of the uh, lost sheep and the parable of the lost coin. There's more detail there. And remember in Hebrew teaching and Hebrew writing and and storytelling, word count matters. It's telling the bigger picture. It's telling the important part. So this is an important part. And I think it's actually the primary, primary part. So while there are minor applications often considered the main, trust God to bring your prodigal home to you, to him and to you. Precious application. Other than application we may have used in our life, it often takes eating pig food in famine to bring the prodigal back when he came to himself. Proverbially true. If you are the prodigal, humble yourself and run to the father right now. He'll run and fall on your neck and kiss you. Absolutely. Be like the prodigal. I mean, be like the father if you have a prodigal right? Keep the door open. Watch with faith the return. Have compassion and kiss the prodigal when he or she returns. Throw a big party, fully forgiven. So, yes. But the key point of the parable, the key point of the parable is the command in one, rejoice with me. The command in the second, rejoice with me. And then in the third, they rejoiced. Great party. That brings us back to the two groups of two. The father represents God. And in this text, I believe the father represents incarnate God. He represents Jesus. He's the father in the story. Why do I say that? Because it says that the public and sinners were drawing near to him. Right? And then the, um, the... uh, Pharisees and scribes were complaining that they were drawing near, that he, Jesus, was eating with, partying, eating, feasting with the sinners, right? So Jesus is the father in this text. Don't let that bother you in a theological sense. It's not speaking, not speaking ontologically that Jesus is the same as God the Father. It's saying he's the father figure in this parable, in this story. So the elder son, that's the scribes and Pharisees complaining. The younger son That's the publicans and sinners drawing near to Jesus. Both are lost, one away and one near home. One is lost because he's gone away from God's moral law, having violated the truths and righteousness of God, the publicans and sinners, attached themselves to the Gentiles, citizens, attached themselves to a citizen in a far far country, living just like the Gentiles. The other one is lost at home. That is, he doesn't even think he's lost. As Jesus repeatedly mentions throughout the scripture about the Pharisees and the scribes, I came to seek and to save the lost. I came to heal the sick. The the well have no need of a physician. Thus, the prodigal is like Jacob and the elder son is like Esau. And that's where the twist comes in and the punch begins to come down. Is let's compare now the story of the prodigal the, using those analogy where we see the analogy of who's the older son, that's the scribes and Pharisees, who's the younger son, that's the sinners and publicans, who's the father, that's Jesus. Now take uh, the, parable, the story of Jacob and Esau. Jacob, Jacob's actions cheat and deprive Esau of his financial inheritance. But in the parable... The older brother is not depleted at all by the father giving inheritance to the younger son. It says in the text, he divided it among them. That's different than the Jacob and Esau story, right? He divided it among them. You, generally speaking, the oldest son got the larger of the inheritance and the younger son got the smaller of the inheritance with the text saying that he divided to them his livelihood And the younger son saying, give to me the goods that fall to me, or give me what I'm owed, it is, I think, a a plain implication that the older son actually got more than the younger son in this story. He got his fair share, unlike Esau, right? 
The older son doesn't lose anything because of the father's generosity and kindness to the younger. I mean, we understand why Esau was so upset. But why was the older brother so upset? The father even doubles down and says, he says in verse 31, all I have is yours. You have so much. Furthermore, the older son assumes he knows what the younger did with the money. He says, but as soon as, and notice he never calls him his brother. But as soon as this son of yours came, I mean, every parent has said at some point in their life, your son or your daughter to their spouse, um, who has devoured your livelihood, wait, I thought the father divided it, (laughs) with harlots. How did he know that? He's assumed it, right? Why? Not, not enough has happened for me to have a conversation, he didn't even know his the brother was back. He just assumed this has happened. And maybe he was right. The text doesn't say explicitly. Maybe he was right. But you can definitely see that he assumes the worst. He hasn't really lost anything financially. And then he accuses the father of not giving him a young goat so he can have a party with his friends. But the father gave him his portion already and says, all that I have is yours. He could have had a party with his friends and a young goat at any time. So it has nothing to do, unlike the Jacob and Esau story, Esau is wronged. The older brother's not wronged. So why is he angry? Furthermore, he doesn't want a party with his father, which is, I think, important in the story. He wants a party with his friends at his father's expense. That's what he wants. There is no desire for relationship with the father figure who is, remember whom? Jesus. There's no desire for a relationship with Jesus. Just wants whatever the father, Jesus, will give them. Bread, food, Prestige. I think there might even be a little bit of a slap at the scribes and Pharisees, and they wanted recognition. They wanted a party with their friends. They wanted their friends to be impressed. It says they gave him, they delivered Jesus over to be crucified out of jealousy, out of envy. So he is angry and jealous, not because he has been wrong, but because his father has been good to his lost brother. That's why. The lost brother who didn't deserve grace and favor, who had sinned it all away, at least in the older brother's mindset. In other words, they're the problem. They're the reason the Romans are over us. They're the reasons why God's judgment's on us. Their sin is the reason. And if they get with the program, stop sinning away God's blessing, we could get back to having God bless our nation again. That's what the scribes and Pharisees thought about people. That was their motivation, their religious motivation. But here is the great reversal. Doesn't this sound more like Cain than Esau? (laughs) Here's the great reversal, though. Jesus, his punch, because now he pulls back from the Jacob as the Esau story. And this is where that comes in that I think is just most powerful. Esau does what the father does in the story. Esau runs to Jacob, falls on his neck, kisses him. Jesus, the father figure, runs to the prodigal, falls on his neck, kisses him. What sort of reputation did Esau have amongst the Israelites? He's called the Bible says, Paul says, as a Jew, describing the thing, Jacob I have loved, Esau I have hated, regarding God's view. Uh, the Jewish author in James calls Esau a profane person. So you see what Jesus is doing? No wonder they wanted to kill him. Esau was better than you. Esau could forgive his brother. Esau could rejoice to see the conversion of Jacob. You can't even bow yourself down low enough to be like the cursed Esau. Now, this is not the first time 
or only time that Jesus has said such things to the scribes and Pharisees, right? He's called them poisonous serpents. He's called them whitewashed tombs. He said, you're like the father, your father, the devil. So this isn't unusual, but I think we get a little idea why they crucified him, why they cried out, crucify him, crucify him, his blood be upon us and our children. He's insulting them deeply. It's not an insult without intent, but it is strong. It is harsh. It is painful. He's saying that Esau was a better brother than they are to the people around them. There is no way that the scribes and Pharisees could have missed this. Given that the story of Jacob is is one of the most written about stories, memorialized Jewish histories, the same words in the Septuagint that Jesus uses of the sons, the two sons, the feeding pigs, the Jacob's flight to a far country, the prodigal's flight to a far country, joining himself to a citizen, Jacob joining himself to Laban, feeding the flock. There's no way they could have missed this, the scribes especially. So what's the moral here then? What is Jesus getting at? There's three morals, I believe, that he's getting at in this story. And it's not about the prodigal. Remember, the the whole half the story is about the older son. Here's the, and we know the point. He says, he spoke this parable to him because the Pharisees and scribes were complaining. This This is why he told them this parable. This is what it's about. Moral number one, if Esau could forgive his brother who had legitimately wronged him, when Jacob shows humble contrition, then the scribes and Pharisees ought to forgive the publicans and sinners who in their coming to Jesus are showing humble contrition. They ought, if Esau could forgive Jacob, who truly slighted him, then how could they not forgive the publicans and sinners who have not slighted them? Just like the older brother. There is, first of all, a call for brotherly reconciliation in the father's house. That is the primary moral of the story. That's the point. Why we have that whole long section about the older brother at the end. <laughs> the point is, the, and that the reason he tells the story, because there, you've got two groups of two people, and one's drawing near, and the other one's complaining. And he's like, you ought not be complaining. Stop complaining. Be like Esau. Which you can't seem to do. Moral number two. Be like, these all build on each other. They're all the point. The reason they're not able able to even rise to the level of Esau, the reason why there is no brotherly reconciliation around Jesus in the Father's house, the reason that they are not able to rise to the level of Esau is because they are lost at home and refuse to see it. That's why. They could not rejoice with the returning brother because spiritually speaking, the religious are just as lost as the obvious sinner. There is none righteous, no, not one. So yes, there is a call for brotherly reconciliation, but brotherly reconciliation could not happen without a humble confession of their lost condition until they see themselves as equal to or perhaps worse than the publicans and sinners, then there is no hope for them to reconcile. There is no point in it. And moral number three, thus they will never enjoy the scribes and Pharisees, the religious ones, will never enjoy the heavenly party. They'll never enjoy the heavenly party with Jesus until they repent and receive Jesus as the personification of the Father's love and embrace. They will not ever enjoy the kingdom of God until they enjoy Jesus' embrace. Now, doesn't he repeat that often throughout the Gospels? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The reason they reject coming to Jesus, the reason they won't come to Jesus and they reject those coming to Jesus because they reject Jesus as coming from the Father. Because they refuse Jesus. So ultimately, this is a call for the older brother to receive Jesus Christ as Lord. So those three things go together. One, he's saying, You ought to be reconciled with your brothers. You're Israel after all, just like Jacob and Esau, both sons of of Isaac. But you can't. 
because you don't see yourself as you ought to. You see yourself as found, as deserving, as righteous. You don't see yourself as lost. You must see yourself as lost, but that's not enough. You must draw near to me like they're drawing near to me, or you'll never be found. I am the way. So we, this parable is actually, which I found an interesting reversal in how I usually used to think about it, is actually more of a call for the scribes and Pharisees to humble themselves and draw near to Jesus than it is for the publicans and sinners to do that. <laughs> That's the ending punch. The ending punch is that. But Jesus is a genius because he starts out with us thinking it's about the publicans and sinners and how that prodigal needs to come to himself and he needs to come back, which is true. But he ends the story sort of in this plot twist. You know who you thought didn't need to come to Jesus is actually the more needful one in the story. But doesn't that fit exactly what we know historically was going on during the life of Christ? Like this is actually at the end a kind of a simple parable. He came unto his own, his own did not receive him. He ate with publicans and sinners because they received him. But the ones that should have received him, the religious ones, they rejected him. And this parable is actually quite simple in the end because that's what it's about. The recurring message in the Bible is reinforced by this parable of Jesus. Just as God came seeking Adam and Eve, who had lost their innocence due to sin, so Jesus came to seek and to save the lost in sin. Those who respond in faith to this rescue mission are found. They're saved. But those who refuse to acknowledge they need to be rescued will be eternally lost, condemned. So rejoice in the grace and mercy of God who brings sinners near him through Jesus. That's the point of the parable. So rejoice. Rejoice. The prodigal rejoices because the father's embraced him. And the elder needs to receive, needs to draw near to the father so that he might rejoice with his brother. Now this will also, by the way, this parable is huge and it's got all these like tentacles that go out. It will have a continuing effect in its application in the book of Acts. Because you don't have now the Pharisees and scribes and the publicans and sinners. You have the Jewish church treating the Gentiles the same way. And so you have this as a Jew-Gentile application, the parable too. And so what's the idea? Um, receive one another, constantly throughout the New Testament letters. Receive one another. Instead of pointing it and saying, yeah, but they're Gentiles. Yeah, but they're Jews. Receive one another in Christ's reception of you. <laughs> like it's constant there. So there's a lot that we could say more, but we are out of time. So let's close our time tonight with singing the doxology. Let's stand. <laughs>